it seems to me that we think a lot about policy and inequality, and my own work focuses in some ways on those issues, but the place that reinforces consciously and unconsciously the nature of how we think about each other racially, what constitutes a black space, a black art, a black cultural um, expression, happens in the form of narrative and storytelling and imagery. And that, those are the places where we're the most open, the most free, and it touches most of us more regularly. You have to be a policy wonk to be paying attention to policy. You don't have to be much engaged in, in media images to actually have to become a part of how they shape uh, the consciousness about race in America. So it's an exceptionally important um, thing. It raises lots of issues, many of which I hope we'll talk about today. You know, uh, does it matter who's making these kinds of images? Does it matter that these are independent, independent from what? Is there something called crossover? Those of you who are 40 and up remember when crossover was like this big deal. Did somebody cross over to pop? They sold out. This is a non-starter conversation in 2018, is, is my position. How did that happen? What does that actually mean? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Has it created opportunity? Y'all are laughing because you know this is, I think about this all day. My, my <laughs> colleagues and students are like, yeah, we've heard this 14,000 times. Um, so the context for cultural spaces for African American and black diasporic art has dramatically changed. Um, so in a funny way, you'll find examples of black culture being at the center of popular culture and then weirdly segregated. I don't know if you all watched the Emmys, but there was this huge constant, you know, nominate all these people of color and then award no one. It was, it was like, the, I was like, you know, can we just go back to when we didn't even get nominated? It's just, it's just a little easier on the psyche. Um, for me, <laughs> since they weren't awarding me anything anyway. Um, so we have amazing uh, cross-generational alums to just get started with those kinds of issues plus many more. So I'm going to start, um, I'm going to do it in alphabetical order, but I'll make sure you know who's who. And you all, I'm sorry, these are short just so we have, you know, forgive me. Okay. Um, you're going to be like, what about these other 90 things I've done? Because really, you have all rock. Um, Bricks and Diamond, who's right here to my left, class of 93. Woo -hoo. He's a trustee, <laughs> trustee of Brown University. He's the CEO of Big Answers, which generates new partnerships and leverages impactful connections for clients in entertainment, technology, and asset management. Brixton is also the founding board member and chair of the Black House Foundation, which is dedicated to expanding opportunities, increasing knowledge, and providing support for black filmmakers through partnerships with the world's most prominent film festivals. And largely under his leadership and the Black House, a record 39 black films were presented at Sundance this past year. That's a lot of films. Now we're out of order, but Tanya Hernandez is, I know, it's okay. It's all right, it's still out of order. It's all good. It's alphabetical up here, you know. I was trying to keep it democratic, you know, because I'm not responsible for the alphabet. Um, <laughs> Tanya, Tanya Hernandez is a class of 86, and woo, woo, yeah. Received her BA from Brown University and her JD from Yale Law School. She's the Archibald R. Mary Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she co-directs the Center on Race, Law, and Justice, and where she serves as its head of global and comparative law programs and initiatives. She's been awarded many prestigious fellowships around the world and is an internationally recognized comparative race law expert. She's the author of a new book entitled Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race, stories of discrimination. And Tanya will be coming back to Brown in about a month, and near the end of October, to give a book talk. If you're in the region, please come by and sign up on our mailing list so you can figure out, learn the details. Welcome, Tanya. <laughs> to Tanya's left is Scott Paulson Bryant, class of 08, but really class of 88. <laughs> the blessing of having Scott twice as a student. In 88, I was a graduate student, and he was an undergrad in my senior seminar. And then he came back. I'm like, you're back? I'm like, OK, well, let's work together again. What, what the heck? Um, 
Scott uh, is a music critic, a writer, novelist, journalist, academic, and now assistant professor in the Department of English at Fordham University with research and teaching interests in 20th century African American literature and popular culture, gender, sexuality studies, the 1970s, which is an interesting decade indeed, film and media studies, and American studies. What especially renders him relevant for this discussion is that uh, Scott uh, became extremely well known in journalism circles for a number of things. One was his uh, legendary 1988 Village Voice cover story about voguing, which was the first national co uh, coverage of this cultural phenomenon. He's also a co-founding editor of Vibe magazine, and I'm certain if you're of a certain age in this room, you have like many copies of Vibe magazine somewhere in a basement box. <laughs> And <laughs> I'm speaking really about myself, apparently. <laughs> I was just remembering, I'm like, I have the whole first year in the box. Okay. His groundbreaking vibe profiles of Sean, who was then Puff Daddy uh, Combs, in 1992 and the De La Soul piece in 93, both won the ASCAP. Um, Deems Taylor Award for Excellence in Music Journalism. Before helping to launch Vibe, he was a staff writer at Spin and editorial director of Giant Magazine. And finally, and definitely not least, is Doreen St. Feli, class of 14. Doreen. <laughs> Doreen is a staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, and she was previously a staff writer at MTV News and an editor-at-large at Lenny Letter. She co-hosts a podcast called Speed Dial at MTV News focused on music, pop culture, sex, and race. Her writings have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, New Yorker, Vogue, The Fader, and Pitchfork. In 2016, Forbes Magazine named Doreen its 30 Under 30 list, citing her work on the Lenny Letter launch with the newsletter reaching 400,000 subscribers in under six months. She's already racked up high praise for the depth of her writing on black popular cultural figures. When I read The New Yorker, I find my, you know, sometimes I read it online and I'm just skimming really quickly on my phone, and then I'm like, this had to have been Doreen. It was just too good. Then I scroll back to the top. I'm like, here she is. And in fact, Pitchfork, um, actually, there's her Pitchfork essay on Rihanna was described by the paper magazine as, quote, the best damn thing ever written regarding Rihanna. <laughs> so join me in welcoming this fantastic group of panelists. So I'm going to come have a seat. Thank you for that. I was going to try to work that out. All right, we're just going to keep this very informal. We want this to be a fun reunion. We don't want people to come back and feel grilled, because then you all won't come back. So, And we love having you. Um, so this is a real opportunity for me to hear from you across so many mediums and generations and contexts. You know, what what is the scope of of what it means to tell black stories in the world today. And you might, some of you who are, you know, slightly um, older vintage, might want to, <laughs> me being the eldest of the bunch, um, you know, might want to talk a bit about what's different. So in particular, I'm just wondering, what's your current state, what's your take on the current state of racial representation in popular culture and media as compared to either previous eras in which you were involved or what you've heard about, you know, in Doreen's case. There are three mics, I think, for four, so you can, like, what, what's your overall sense? Yeah, thank you. I don't know if it's on, can you hear me? Yes. Here we are, uh, so, so I've been working around the film business for the last 12 years or so, mm. but certainly watching black content for as long as I've been alive because looking for representation of myself in, in various ways. And so, you know, I think we're probably at the third or fourth peak blackness uh, <laughs> zenith uh, in, in, in modern times in terms of film and media. Uh, and, you know, so you think about that in terms of black exportation, but even before that, you think about sort of black folks on TV, when you get the Ed Sullivan show and the Supremes coming on, right. uh, to, to black exportation, to the, uh, the peaks in the 80s and 90s. Any era has a great peak of it. But now I think it's interesting because of the sheer volume of content that's being distributed and the multiple platforms on which you can capture it. Right. So, so I think that you know, this, the democratization of content, um, which insults some people in my film space, which is film is film, it's not content, it's art. Uh, is uh, this notion of I can make whatever I want. I can get it to anybody who has eyes or ears. 
Uh, so therefore, I don't need these big platforms to, 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 to control what I make or what I distribute. And so in that environment, I think that we are at a real sort of turning point in terms of what's possible. That is being very naive about commerce <laughs> and about uh, what makes money and making a living. So say, before you go, hold on, you can't end on that little, you know, <laughs> commerce and then pass the mic. So, so say just a little bit more about why you think that's naive, because what you're basically saying is that there's been this massive expansion in the capacity to distribute and create, but the assumption is that that expansion produces opportunities for more development of broader representations or more radical representations or ones that break certain boundaries, but you're basically saying there's a naivete for people who hold this position? Because they're still gatekeepers, right? right? And so for me to, and any of my favorite example is Issa Rae, who knows uh, misadventures with awkward black girl, right? So that's Issa's sort of start. Uh, and that's Issa, you know, coming out of Stanford, just making stuff with her friends. Uh, and that gets a lot of traction, and then she gets a, a deal with ABC, and not just ABC, with Shondaland, right? But the, the, you know, I, I've had Issa on panels and talked to her about this for years. She said that that show, uh, she didn't know what she was doing, so she took notes from everybody. Uh, anyone who had thought about the content, she'd take it and she'd incorporate it. In the end, she ended up with something that wasn't funny and it wasn't her. Uh, and that deal fell apart. So nothing came out of Shondaland for Issa Rae, and Larry Wilmore called uh, and then developed uh, Insecure. But, but again, that's HBO, and, and I think HBO is generous and engaged and, and wanted to hear her voice, but that validation mattered, right? You wouldn't have Issa Rae today without that validation, and you need those platforms. And I would even say as black people, we deserve those platforms, but there's still a lot to do to get the access because there's lenses and, and sort of perspectives and bias that stand in the way. Yeah. One point you made there, and then I'm, I'm passing the mic over to someone else, but what's important there too is that we think about uh, artists as being fully formed with a statement that they're ready to give, whereas what you're describing is a nurturing, transformative process that is both you know, exciting, but also is a, a source of vulnerability. Right. It, well, it, and, and as, it, as it turned out in the you know Shondaland, but it's also I mean, so vulnerability is not always a bad word. No, right. No, it's, no, no. it's it's you know, so you're, it's you're, open. you're evolving as an artist. I'm a right. big fan of of film festivals and of labs at film festivals, and and that's because it gives you a community. Um, so who's seen Sorry to Bother You, Boots Riley's uh, new film? Who knows uh, the Coop, Boots Riley's original um, rap? Uh, group. Uh, and so he talked about being in the Sundance Lab, and Boots went to every single lab Sundance had, right? He was like, I'm going to get everything y'all got. Uh, and he learned, and he had the masters telling him and helping him hone his craft exactly. before his first film. Right. Uh, and I think that's that, perfect. That's, that, that we need to be breaking down those doors right. uh, and on the platforms that are going to edit and give you notes and say crazy crap to you yeah. so you can learn how to stand up and how to find that voice because you're carving it out of stone. Right, right, excellent. All right, who else wants to tell our third your take on this current state of racial representation media? All right, Dory. I'll go next. We can just keep it going down. Yeah, okay. Fine. Um, so media, I'd say that I started working in media four years ago at this point um, at a very critical time. It was post-recession. Um, but also post social media as uh, an actual platform for people to build you know, their careers off of. Um, this is also, to put it in a global, global context, this is post Arab Spring, this is right around Ferguson. Um, and I think it really affected the way gatekeepers in media started to think of uh, what their mastheads looked like, who was actually doing the reporting about not merely black culture and black images and how they're processed, but also black people and how they decide to process those images for themselves. Um, and because of that uh, weird gap period pre-Trump lambasting the existence of media, I was able to take advantage of that. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people in my micro class of uh, writers who are journalists of color, queer journalists who were both tokenized, but also nurtured because of our uh, specific viewpoints. This was a great moment where uh, gatekeepers decided to actually uh, exploit the specific knowledge that we had. And of course, it's a mutual exploitation. Um, and for me, it, I think it's a very critical moment in journalism. It seems that 
there are more black writers and journalists at these institutional legacy magazines that, than have ever been before, but at the same time, we're not seeing many people get hired as editors. We're not seeing them really get hired on the business side. And of course, that affects who you see on the covers of magazines. Um, I think a, a great example would be the New York Times Magazine recently did a story on um, the opioid epidemic. And the photo of the magazine was a mother, and she's presumably white, she has blonde hair, and it's covering her face, and she's cradling a child. Now, let's contrast that image with the images of the crack babies of the 80s and the early 90s. And I think um, I've had these conversations with peer journalists who realize we feel like it's a pressure cooker, right? We're like getting to the top. We're almost able to articulate ourselves mm. in the way that we'd like to, but there's always this just um, this ceiling that it's, it's, it's very difficult to crack. You know, there's mm -hmm. a glass ceiling, but then there's a concrete ceiling. And I think when we talk about um, what media workers of color can actually get accomplished given the historical uh, boundaries that prevent them from getting those things accomplished, that's what we're talking about. Do you find that it's difficult if you were to challenge and say, look at this cover article and this image of this mother versus pull out random, I mean, is there a worry that there would be repercussions? I think it's more that, in some ways, conversation, discussion, diversity talks have been fetishized in these professional spaces. Mm. So everybody loves to have the talk. It's like, yeah, let's have a <laughs> panel. Let's have 10 panels. But when it comes to actually instrumentalizing yeah. what is being discussed, if you don't have people um, in places of power, it's difficult to see a conversation get concretized into right. a spread or into a certain journalist getting assigned to a story versus right. another one. That's very helpful. Thank you. Tanya? Um, yeah, I'd like to bit, uh, sort of throw myself in here. And if for some of you are wondering, why does a lawyer have anything to be talking about on this panel? Um, uh, it's because as a lawyer, I care about the ways in which you know, there are representations in media that affect how law is enforced, and in particular, how law is enforced with regards to issues of inequality, discrimination, et cetera. So with the shift that I have uh, noticed <laughs> 30 years since graduating from Brown, um, <laughs> is that when it comes to media representations about how people identify, that blackness is become, has come to be treated as if it were a trap, as opposed to a liberatory space. You know, that this idea that, oh, you know, you, blackness, that's so restrictive. Why do you just identify just as black? Or you don't really look black. Why do you want to choose to identify as black? Um, and that is something that I view as um, both a faux kind of ad, way of, liber, of, of to talking about, about liberty. You know, this idea of like your personal equality is about your ability to break out of race or racial category, um, and that the rest of us are fools who are like, you know, clinging to blackness because we are sort of stuck in a pre-civil rights world. Mm. Um, and that, I think, is really problematic for when judges pick up these ideas in media, right? It's, you know, it's part of our culture, or are exposed to it all, um, and they start to treat civil rights law as, oh yes, it's very antiquated. You know, yeah. now we're all free to be transracial, uh, and so, all right, um, and so you know things that you see in the workplace that go down. Well, that's not really about racism. That was a misunderstanding, et cetera. Um, yeah. And that's one aspect of the absence of um, journalists of color that I think is also problematic. But also, even with journalists of color, which stories get amplified? Which stories get picked up? And I think that there's this angle about. Um, identifying with blackness as being old-fashioned and narrow-minded right. that is more seductive in an elite media space um, that is not beneficial uh, to our civil rights. Right, right. Wow, very nice. Thank you. Scott? Um, yeah, as, as someone who isn't as involved sort of professionally with the sort of that sort of space as I used to be, um, um, to your point about um, democratization and gatekeepers, I'm sort of fascinated by the way social media has transformed those kinds of positions. Like, 
like who are the gatekeepers now when it comes to sort of like black Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a which is a space of cultural production, right? And I and I'm really fascinated by the ways in which we don't. It isn't always about sort of the kind of journalism that like Doreen and I did at one point, right? But these sort of smaller, more niche. Um, direct marketing, almost sort of ways in which people can communicate their ideas and their thinking about blackness. Um, I mean, I just think about like the Rachel Dolezal sort of tyranny, that sort of tyranny of the memes that came out of that. Right? There was a kind, there was a narrative in that, and there was a sort of a propulsion and sort of thinking about and talking about race in these interesting kind of ways because of someone like Rachel Dolezal. Um, um, when the Rachel Dolezal story broke, that was a moment where I thought, I wish I was a journalist again. Like, I would have <laughs> some, some fun things to say about that. Um, um, but yeah, but, um, but I also find myself thinking a lot, to your point, Trisha, about the ways in which sort of black cultural production has been um, sort of simultaneously foundational to this American project, culturally speaking, but also marginalized, right, at the same, at the same time, oftentimes. Um, and I think that this sort of, this sort of changing thoughts, thinking about gatekeeping as sort of a way of sort of controlling or sort of maintaining or containing um, what black cultural production is, has, there are, sort of, there are sort of these free spaces now that I found. Like when we were starting Vibe, um, one of the reasons we started Vibe was precisely because of the opioid kind of thing, right? Because of the way the crack baby was being represented, right? And we, how could we make a magazine that read beautifully about blackness, that looked beautiful, um, because that's a big part of it, not just what people Read, but the actual images they see, right? Um, how can we sort of get the photographers and get the writers who could sort of express blackness in this like um, creative and and foundational way um, and resist the sort of narratives that were out there, right? And we were we were owned by Time Inc. at the time, and you know, so there were fights to be had, but we won them more often than not because we sort of saw the space that needed to be sort of pushed, resisted, and pushed against. Um, so I'm I'm just fascinated as again, like just as a viewer right now. Um, I will say not to be critical, but my sort of the one thing, the sort of resistance I have to this fascination I have is that there's still this thing called quality control. Um, and sometimes the sort of lack of gatekeeping um, as, I don't know, a and people or as editors or means that I find myself reading interesting stuff that feels like, feels very first draft, right? And I think there's a way in which we, and I feel like we sort of encourage a kind of, I, <laughs> I mean, it, I love the democratization of culture that way, but I also feel like there are ways in which first draft culture doesn't free us either, right? So um, that's just something I've been yeah, thinking yeah, about. Been, so. I, do want, I do want to jump in back. No, Scott, the, 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 there's still gatekeepers even in this, this sort of social media world because the algorithm is out there. See, no, that, and, and that is absolutely no right. controlling that is, what that you and true. I see every day. That is very right? true. And mm -hmm. so, and that's baseless and, and sometimes really mindless in terms of who's building the algorithm because they don't think about us when they're building it. And so I think about that, but, but also the people, I think that we all have throwbacks and they're folks that we're relying on. So I, I literally had a conversation yesterday uh, about Scott. Uh, and about yes, me? yes, about you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and about the impact of his writing in Facebook. Right, so yes, I think the last thing I read from you was oh, you yeah, saying you're not going to comment anymore, and then you went on to comment. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that's my own so, sort of self-policing. Yeah, yeah. right. You didn't do a good job. Uh, <laughs> then we're all like, well, what's he going to say? Uh, and then the engagement piece. So it, there's the algorithm first that says what I get to see at all, right? right? But then there is the power of the, the, the writer to take it back and say, all right, I'm going to engage these audiences. We're just going to play into the algorithm because the more engaging I am and the more responsive I am, the, the higher I'm going to float up in terms of people's pages. So there's this whole sort of math thing going on that I think we all need to be more aware of um, that ranges from how your engagement with your followers lifts you in terms of visibility to opening weekends on on content, on television, on film. So Napoli Ever After is on Netflix this weekend. You got to go home and just play it, even if you're not watching it, um, to make the numbers go up so right. that they make more because Netflix is really guarded about what the numbers are. Uh, but they will show up to a creator and say, the numbers just aren't here anymore. Sorry, you're done. Do you, can I ask you a question, do you see, um, t in terms of Facebook, um, yeah. Facebook is actually really valuable for someone like me who was a journalist, right? 
because I can feel like I can be part of a public conversation that I used to be a part of, um, mm -hmm. and sort of be more personal, engaged about it. Um, but I, the, the Netflix question makes me think. It sort of makes me think about the sort of conversations we used to have about opening weekends for black films, and and so it's like everyone go see it, buy the ticket, even if you don't go, or buy two, or, and but then we see Hollywood not respond with a slew of a whole lot of new black films, right? Like, we, we have the sort of moment now. Yep. Does Net, is Netflix sort of similar to that, you think, in TV, like, so, or of streaming? Like, if we do all show up, there will be more to show up for? Or? Yes. No. Um, but, 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 but we won't know <laughs> what they're doing, because it's sort of behind uh, this curtain, right, 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 right. right? But I think it is this notion of they, they look at the numbers aggressively, and they follow them. The, the beauty and the, 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 the upside and downside of Netflix is they are making so much content, they just give you money. They're like, this is, this is, you know, you got a good thing, Doreen. We like it. It's due on the 12th. Thanks. And then you, you get it. And they, if, as long as it's not, you know, garbage, no offense, they put it on. And if nobody watches it, they don't, they don't come back. But if somebody comes back, they're going to, they're gonna do, you're going to have another one and another one and another one and another one. Oh, that's good. And they have this thing now called Strong Black Lead. Uh, I'm not, they're not a client yet, Netflix. Uh, but you know, they're the Strong Black League, which came out just when the controversy hit right. with the communications director using the N-word in, in a meeting and publicly oh, and then using right. it again in the review meeting with HR about the first meeting. So it was like, it's like problematic. Yeah, missing the point, right? Missing the point. Yeah. But, but they, they but, now have Strong Black League and they're really driving that forward and they want right. more audience. Right. But at the same time, there is a fundamental tension here for me. So tell me if I'm, you know, anyone and everyone can pipe in on this. So on the one hand, you're saying if work gets done and it gets a lot of viewers, then there'll be more of that work. Well, what is the work that gets a lot of viewers? What is the existing framework about what constitutes a black performance that has enough mass appeal to actually generate the proper numbers? And so we end up with, and I know y'all are fans, but whatever. You have another, we get another empire, you know? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Everybody's Star. got their guilty pleasure. That, everybody's got their guilty pleasure. That's not mine. <laughs> um, or Tyler mine, Perry. That's not mine, mine either. Um, but my, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm simply saying that the assumption that the pre existing kind of black consumer is a critically sophisticated about black culture and history and is not rendering the same kinds of potential narrative, you know, faux pas, tropes, you know, stereotypes that we would be challenging if other people made them. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how we get out of that bind if we don't have um, more than just the question of representation and amount of representation and success as our, as our lenses. There's been, um, as someone who basically lives on the internet, mm -hmm. writes about the internet, reports on the culture of the internet, wow. I've no, it's well, terrible. At least you're here in person. We're about. very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Just popping out of my hole. Uh, one chorus I've observed online probably over the past two and a half years has been the unapologetic blackness of blank. Um, mm. and the reason why people use this headline so much, so initially it's, it's just a headline, right? The point is to, to grab you. So they could be talking about the unapologetic blackness of Empire, for example, in mm -hmm. 2016. But then you read the article and then it really is just like a review. The point is just for you to click. Um, but then the headline ended up, this like headline ideology ended up exerting this dominance on the way people actually started doing their criticism so that blackness ended up becoming a cipher. It wasn't about like specifically reporting on the aspects of the art. It was just repre like representation was the end goal, mm -hmm. which is to say, this uh, show has an all black writer staff, so it's good. Mm -hmm. Or this show has an all black female directors. I'm thinking of a specific show. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> so that means it's good. Um, and I, it's been really frustrating for me as a critic because I think in general there's a there's always been a culture of bootlickery, mm -hmm. but it's very high right now because I think there's an assumption that, okay, we're getting our chances. Critics need to be in cahoots with us to make sure that those chances end Survive. up surviving. Um, and I've found myself sometimes just deciding to not even cover something because I know, you know, if I decide that I hate this season of Insecure, 
I'm going so. to be made a pariah online. You can't say right. so. Um, and that, here's that, the that's the social media downside. Yeah, right? and, and it is that, a downside. That, that was running people thought, out of town. A thought. Right. And I actually, I really like this season of Insecure, but I think that <laughs> <laughs> somebody was going to tweet that you didn't. So oh, it's no. really, really right. good that you I clarified was like, that, I was Dory. Like Rose, let me finish. <laughs> um, but I think it's, you know, as a critic, our environment is just impoverished when people cannot disagree. There should always be someone who doesn't like something. There should be someone who hates Black Panther and says, you know, puts out a... <laughs> Here's the thing, though. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not a well-liked like people. I'm standing with her on that. I got, I got, I got beef with Black Panther. <laughs> but, you know, I'm with critics you too. are not well liked, but I think that to me, <laughs> to me, I've just noticed that there is um, there is a homogenizing of of thought happening around black criticism and thinking about the voice, which rest in peace. That's it's a tragedy that the voice has been killed in the way that it has been. One of the reasons why that paper was so foundational for me was because I was reading people I didn't agree with all the time, but I was still so moved by their thought processes, by the excavation work that they were doing in order to evidence their arguments. And so I think that there is something about this quick hit uh, critical culture where you either like something or you don't like something that denies nuance, it denies ambivalence, mm. and it creates uh, like an ontological position of the black consumer where they only like things or they don't like things. They buy things or they don't buy things, and there are other ways to engage. Yeah, to, I, I imagine working with people you don't disagree with at The Voice. That was my experience. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so the, the downside to my sort of you know loving of the sort of cultural production of the internet is the way in which criticism now is sort of framed as hating, right? Yeah. Like there is no sort of critique anymore. There is no, if you don't like something, you're a hater. You're hating it. You're not, you're a hater of it. You're not a critic of it. Um, but also this sort of hot take culture that we're living in, the sort of think piece culture. Like I hate think pieces now. Like everyone has a think piece about every idea um, that comes down the pike. And it's just like, but it doesn't feel like you thought about it. Like to, for, for it to be a think piece, like, you know? Um, so yeah, that does get bothersome. But I also think there's that way in which that unapologetic blackness thing, which annoys me to to no end, is a kind of sort of response to the sort of respectability thing that everyone sort of is talking about in, in social media. And I wonder if there's this sort of this sort of holding on to this unapologetic blackness thing and grouping blackness under this sort of weird, huge umbrella um, in, encompassing all sorts of ratchet or you know crazy behaviors is a way that people are sort of um, 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 holding on to something that they feel like they're losing. And I don't know if that's sort of the remnants of crossover culture in a way, or um, a way of sort of um, um, losing a black public or something, or I don't, I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't quite understand the unapologetic blackness. Like, are we, it, it encompasses everything from like Serena on the tennis court to Black Panther, um, to, um, you know, to which I agree can use some criticism sometimes. Um, um, yeah, but I just, yeah, so I just, I just wonder about whether that has a lot to do with this respectability conversation people are trying to have too in these sort of stunted think pieces that get published the day after something happens. But a slight so, turn on that is y'all don't go to see stuff, right? So this room is probably the, the quintessential sort of profile of black folks who don't consume the, the content. <laughs> just just to attack you all just brazenly. Uh, <laughs> why, why do you think that? Because we're old? Like, cause no, we're, I think we, we, we have lots of options. We have lot, we can read, we can travel, we can go see theater. So when the when stuff comes out that's really beautiful in the, in the, in the cinema, who has time to go see it? You have so many options that we, we're not consuming it. So it's Made, I mean, this is the worst audience to produce for, because you're not going to watch four or five hours of TV a day, right? You don't have that kind of time. You're not on Facebook. You're not. Well, don't so people are like? Well, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but again, I think the challenge becomes, you know, when I see a lot of stuff at festivals that is really beautiful black art, I'm like, well, good luck. No one's going to. This is not for the mainstream audience, and the and the the, the art house black audience, I think, is not vibrant enough to really sustain this stuff. And that's not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying you don't. Uh, and therefore, it's hard if you're not voting with your dollars and your feet to expect the market to produce more of it. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I think there's another interesting aspect of this internet culture, right? You know, the yay and the nay of it. Um, and it's what passes for public discourse, but is really quite deficient. And, 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 and here I'm referring to the comments, you know, back and forth. Right? Because people have, this is what I've observed, that the comment section is almost like a drop the mic moment. You know, I said my two cents, bang, right? And, right? and I'm not, one, I'm not really listening to what you're saying, so we're not really having an exchange. It's just that the screen is showing back, 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 back. So it looks like an exchange, but it's not really an exchange. I mean, just a quick little anecdote. Right? I had this little, uh, uh, an essay that I posted up on, I guess it was Medium, because uh, I couldn't get nobody to do it uh, uh, <laughs> in another outlet. Um, and so I was simply saying that, you know, the thing about uh, multiracial discrimination cases is that it gets pitched as being about something new and unique and novel, right? But then in actuality, once you get past someone just saying what their personal identity is, that they get discriminated against in all the same crude ways that just generic black people uh, experience, right? You know, it's about you being not white, right? That's ultimately what about. Anyway, so on the comments section, huh, this person came for me, huh, and, and so I said, and I said, thank you so much for your comment, right? Uh, but the, the, when the back and the forth was, you're just trying to impose the one drop rule. You're just trying to minoritize me, right? And I, I was simply, I wasn't even talking about personal identity. I, you know, I was simply saying that when discrimination happens, your yeah, identity is irrelevant, right? Uh, but the, what was passing for this public conversation, us being in public discourse, what the, the one outlet that we supposedly democratically have for yeah. public engagement is so impoverished mm -hmm. because it's a performance of public discourse without right. the richness of public discourse, and that is a harm for us as black people. Right. Right. So, call-out culture is real. So is the this is this culture. partly the result of these being, as you were kind of starting to get at, Scott, kind of black spaces that are kind of surrounded they're you know by the worries about holding on to space and worrying about holding on to a certain kind of you know autonomy so we don't have black newspapers we don't have black media outlets really we have places that have black uh, stories and writers and producers in them so is that what you think is creating this kind of well, any of you this hyper defensiveness as it were or is it something else um, that's going on because uh, you know the, you're you have, you're of two minds on this panel around the role of gatekeepers, um, right? I mean, you were saying the gatekeepers were still there, and in some ways that's problematic because they control what we see. And then there's the gatekeepers not only for first draft to second draft, but gatekeepers for critical engagement to say this is some nonsense. It's not an argument. It's just you know a refusal. Um, so what do you think is behind this this kind of spatial um, protectiveness or defensiveness, and, and how might we take advantage of this extraordinary expansion? I mean, we, we haven't had this much opportunity to communicate with other human beings in the history of human beings every second all the time. In fact, a few less minutes of it, I'd be happy, actually. <laughs> it's a little too much communication for me. But, but what do we, you know, can, how can we transform this space? Because, I mean, you, you know what I mean, without losing our, our places, as it were. Right, Brixen referred to the, um, um, how did you describe it, the, now I'm forgetting the word you used. Um, but, but, but to your point, um, Tricia, um, the word will come to me, I have a bad memory these days, um, is when I said the thing about sort of the black, the black Twitter as cultural production thing, um, that, I, like, think, I think, I think that's one of the ways the internet works, right? So social media can have, can have real kind of cultural value and sort of show us ourselves and educate each other and all that stuff. Um, but call out culture is real, right? It's like everyone wants to drop the mic and sort of, and that's sort of connected to the way in which everyone is a critic now. Right? Like social media has allowed everyone's voice to be parts of these conversations, no matter how the algorithms end up working, right? But everyone gets a chance to do it. But I think to you, oh, your point about sort of this sort of ebbs and flows of black cultural production, like I, 
black people always, we always have the experience of loss, right? Or, or theft, right? There's always a way in which being foundational to American popular culture, we put it out there, we create from the blues, to jazz, to hip hop, whatever, and then we see it get stolen from us, right? Or in terms of market or in terms of value. Right. So I think there's a, the way in which the internet has value because there is a kind of ownership. There is a, like that black public thing I was talking about that gets created over and over and doesn't have the sort of, in a way, doesn't have the sort of um, ability to be stolen in a way, right? And, and if people do steal it, a new fast thing will come up right behind it and doesn't have to go through the ebb. The flow can always be there. Yeah. You're, you're, op you're optimistic, uh, member of this. I have to this, be. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, probably, I think probably because I'm a professor now. Like, I sort of have to be in a way. You know what I mean? Because, like, these students yeah, come to me true. as a writing professor and as a literature professor and a pop you study, you know, scholar of popular culture, whatever that means. And, um, and, and a lot of them want to be part of that space. I think there's a way in which I have to maintain a kind of optimism mm -hmm. as much as I push back against first draft culture. Like, I still, I, I feel like it's part of the, the game right. for me now, in a way. Right. To, to sure. hop on that a little bit, I think it's about the scarcity mindset, right? So we all, I think you, you want to be the mic drop because you think there's only so much attention to be had, right? And so I think that that notion that there's only so much to be had plays against us, again, because we're used to it giving, being taken away from us. And I think it goes to not just ownership of your social profile and your platform in terms of your page of the world, but also for us to start investing in, in, in the means of communication, right? I think black ownership in terms of media, I think is is not at a peak level. It's certainly been higher before. I think you think Richelieu Dennis buying Essence uh, is a is a big move, and investing in black media in that way is a is, is sort of a trend I'd like to see more of, mm -hmm. of us actually owning in, in various communities, black communities, Latino communities, um, mm -hmm. Asian American communities, LGBT communities, folks, you know. So this is, we talked more about, about the uh, the billionaire buying the publication today. Right? You don't need to be a billionaire to buy a, a couple of black publications uh, or platforms. I think that's part of the secret sauce. To get much less scarcity uh, in the ownership side is going to make a difference for us. Yeah, yeah. Just very quickly to punctuate this observation, I think that there is, so social media has built in uh, structures that create a faux credentialing system, which is to say that if you get a certain number of followers, you're more likely to become verified, whatever that means. You have a blue check on your name, and all of a sudden, that it's like a megaphone. And it also um, creates this like really unhealthy di dynamic when blue check people say something, it's taken as you know, the common law of the internet. Um, and, and then I think. <laughs> I've noticed this, and it's trickled into media a little bit, where people who you know just became very good at talking on social media, you don't need to be incredibly smart to be good at social media. It's about identifying like certain patterns of talking, certain patterns of identifying what's trending and like speaking to that. It's a very easy game to do. That's why the Russians were able to create <laughs> this army of black bots. You know, people were interacting with bots. These were not real black people, but they were so. It, Basically, you know, these um, programmers just figured out the way the most popular people interact on these social media platforms and were able to just like create a calculation and it, and it did it. Um, and I think what the like blue check culture does is that um, it makes everyone's comment therefore a referendum on their blackness. So if you have an opinion that the, for some reason, the majority of people don't agree with all of a sudden you're not black enough or you're, I mean, I've seen people get called coon online, like it's nothing. Um, and I think that when we create this, this strange stage where every single bit of a person's, um, uh, Everything that a person says or everything that they don't, they end up adding to this popular conversation ends up being seen either as vaunted as a law or as terrible as a sin. It's just an unhealthy dynamic, you know? And then that's when you have the like cancel culture where someone like has an opinion that people don't agree with and then all of a sudden that person is not deep. Yeah, that person is trash. They're not deemed to be, a, you know, considered to be a part of whatever us, the popular, consensus of what blackness is supposed to perform itself like online, that person is therefore not a part of it anymore. Um, and so I think that the credentialing, this idea that 
if you are able to accrue a lot of people, which could just be who knows what followers are at this point, um, that somehow makes you more of an important voice than someone who just has like a few hundred followers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just high school stuff, but amplified in this space. Right, right. Really interesting. So how do you think the kind of globalization of social media spaces has transformed this notion of what constitutes a black audience? Is there a global context, a set of multiracial, mixed race, Brazilians, other Latin Americans, Caribbean, people, Africans, others who are part of this conversation, in other words, this spatial kind of racial parameter drawing? Has it, is it having an impact or are they sort of victimized by the, what, what might be an American sort of domination of the way the technology is developing? Um, if I could throw myself in this one, um, I've, I have seen positive aspects of it, right? Having t two seconds ago about seeing negatives off the other side. Um, the, the way I've seen the positive aspects of the internet culture um, in the global arena is that for Afro-descended peoples outside of the United States, which is actually the majority. <laughs> you know, three percent of slaves brought to the United States, North America, ninety percent and plus more, the Americas, right? Latin America, the Caribbean. Anyway, uh, so the, for Afro-descended people outside of the United States, uh, mainland, uh, to be able to engage on something as sort of a detail about natural hair, right? For Afro-descendant women outside of the United States to have access to YouTube channels about natural hair, products, et cetera, that is a liberatory space, right? Because within, um, for Brazil for the longest time, right? No, the idea was, yeah, we have the largest majority of, of Afro-descendant people outside of Nigeria in Brazil, but pff, you're gonna wear your hair like that? You know, mm, that's not professional. I mean, all the same good hair, bad hair, nonsense conversations that we have in the United States, they exist in Latin America. Um, and so to be able to have access to the um, US black conversations, albeit in English, but still, right? You know, the imagery is very pop powerful, and you Google Translate, ba boom, and now everyone has this access. Mm -hmm. um, there's something. Uh, there's a diasporic, a liberatory uh, possibility there that I mean I think is really quite phenomenal. But I think about the other platforms, and so we are so U.S. centric in the U.S. Right. And and so you know when I travel as, a, as an African American to even Canada, I realize hey wait a minute uh, there's a whole different experience right up there uh, where Trump will invade next. Uh, but it, it's it's fascinating to think about that on both the positive side, because there are dynamics and markets where a lot of these companies are investing um, and, and, and creating local content. And Nollywood is what, the, the second or third largest uh, film market in the world. And that's all black film all the time. So I think there are places where it's happening. I think the challenge in some ways becomes that, uh, that, that we tend to be the most vocal uh, of the Afro-descendant folks in the world in terms of our in, outside of Africa in terms of our rights and our perspective and, and where we want to be in the world. And so you see a lot of the tropes, even on the continent, around skin color and around straightening of hair and lightening of skin. And there are products that are you know, just sort of popular around the world that are terrifying that I think we've been able to dispense with here in many ways. But there is, cult, there is black, we as black Americans do not define black culture in the world necessarily. Um, and, and, and we have really great tentacles out, but I think there are local spaces where there are stories being told that we have no awareness of at all. So before we open it up to the audience, which we're just about to do, I want to ask one final question, which is, you know, where do you think the next best sort of place for creating, you know, rich and complex cutting edge black storytelling is going to take place? You know, either where you hope it's going to happen or where it's actually already happening and you know how can we help you know sort of expand that space <laughs> I, I can jump in I, 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 yeah, yeah, like, I don't know. I, so so all uh, so all the artists I'm working with now uh, in the age of what we think is peak television I'm telling them to go to the studios uh, to make traditional studio films because the studios are desperate uh, and so I, I spent most of my career in the asset management business, and my thesis is buy low, sell high. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> and so if Netflix, Amazon, and, and, and Apple are spending, you know, what, 15, 17 billion dollars on content this year, uh, collectively, the studio's gotta make something, right? Uh, and if we got enough ex development executives in there and you can ride the Black Panther wave, whatever it is, uh, and you can ride the Crazy Rich Asians wave, uh, you know, these movies have performed. Uh, and so the studios, and I don't just say this theoretically, I'm talking to studios who are like, we gotta get something on the screens. Mm. So it's not for everybody, but if you have, right. if you have the way, uh, girl trip, you know, girls, <laughs> girls trip, girls yeah. trip is, a, again, yeah, um, there are, are ways to get out there uh, and have some opportunities, even if you're not Kevin Hart. Right. <laughs> so so your, your point there is less about the venue itself, but more about being strategic about where there's an opening. Where there's an opening, where, right. where, where, where it is like low, that, where yeah. people are desperate, you, yeah. you know, you gotta go sell your wares because they need yeah. your opportunity. Right. And think about Fox. Who remembers Fox when it first came out? It was like the blackest thing there was. Uh, it couldn't be further from that uh, until, or, and now I'm gonna get real controversial, think about OWN. Own was not black until white women weren't watching it. Uh, and now, <laughs> is real black. <laughs> so what is that, sell low, buy low, sell high? Buy low, is sell high. Just, <laughs> just checking. I okay, don't know if this is point. because of the, the algorithms on my social media feeds, but I, I'm, I'm feeling like there's a real flowering in black letters, right, in black literature right now. Um, like, I just, like, in the last like few months, I've like found all these like books by new young black writers who are getting published independently and by the majors um, and are sort of in a really in interesting conversation around blackness and sort of di diaspora. And um, mm. um, big shout out for my boy Kiese Lemon, whose new book mm -hmm. Heavy is coming out. Um, who's, and that book is gonna change the game in very many ways in terms of thinking about autobiography and the memoir and representations mm. of blackness. Um, so I have a lot of faith in the sort of literary community right now and like some just editors I know who are very active about finding black writers, young black writers especially, mm. um, to tell different kinds of stories. And also particularly in the young adult market, I'm noticing a lot of sort of oh. forward mo moment and progression there. Interesting. So. Interesting. SZA did tweet yesterday that books are making a comeback. SZA did? SZA would. And I don't follow SZA, so I don't I know. I take all my do. cultural forecasting from SZA. <laughs> 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 Even I'm like, who? Um, <laughs> Not making a comeback. SZA's your hope for the future? <laughs> um, I guess I'll just quickly say I definitely feel the same way. I've um, there's a count that's done every year. It's called the Vita count, and basically just like counts how many women. They don't break it down by race, even though they should. Um, are participating in both media and books, and very incrementally the number creeps um, up every year. So uh, for me, you know, thinking also about like what spaces that black women in particular can create their cultural production in. Books is definitely a space. Um, but again, living online, I, I've noticed like the, there's this like polymathic uh, kind of young black teenager who makes content for the internet. And I don't know how it'll be um, you know, put under one house. I don't know if these kids are gonna end up being filmmakers or if they'll end up being uh, less traditional storytellers, but they're just, these, I remember like two years ago, I interviewed a bunch of kids from Atlanta who just moved to Hollywood because they decided that they were going to be famous. Mm -hmm. They had become very known, well known on Vine, which is a defunct uh, video sharing uh, application. And it was the first time I'd say in like, I know I'm a little bit younger, but it was the first time I had a sense of, this is a generation that's going to be this generation of polymathic creators is going to be solidified in 20 years. You know, they're going to Hollywood. Maybe they'll like get a studio together and make their videos. Also, they make music. They da they dance. Um, and so, in that vein, I think that there's a lot of originators deciding uh, independent ways to make their content. They're finding smaller ways to get funded. And so, for me, obviously, hearing about all of these steps that are made in film are very exciting, but I think on um, smaller platforms there are ways for kids who are 18, 19 years old to kind of just like burst out um, even while they're not yet fully formed and be able to, you know, make TV shows, make um, 
videos that might not be widely seen, but offer them an opportunity to, to get better in education. So that's what I'm excited about, independent kids online. Right.